start. Hello, hello. We are back here in our new chapter. It's about uploading and also downloading files in our Chinese apps. Uh, I think for this session, it's much better just running a sharing, a sharing file scripts. So yeah. Or instead of a presentation, I, I check some five scripts and I will explain you how they work. So our first example is here. They explain in the book that the maximum size of files that you can load by default is just five megabytes. If you want to be able to load a much bigger files, you need to change this specification in the options. For example, if I want 50 megabytes, I just need to run this line and you will be able. And starting for the UI, you need to have an input button and you have also an ID related to that. Maybe a label, but no, no mandatory. Um, and also the label for the bottom. Um, and, and also you have this argument multiple if you want to pick more than one file. And here's just for display the table. And let's look which information we have under the upload uh, argument. So the in the import part, let's run it. If you can see here, this is just the bottom and the information we saw here. If you if we click over pull up, if I go to the the shiny rep to the folder. Samples, chapter nine, and we pick any of these data sets. Uh, we can see the information here, right here. We can see that we have a name. So this is a data frame. So basically, if you want to have the name, you will need to have an extra person to, to have it. Also, you have the size, the type, and an automatic address that Chani, it's like a temporal file. So yeah, it have a lot of codes, but we don't need to, uh, we don't need to memorize anything of that. We just need to know that it's inside one folder inside our computer. And we have this information to get, and the most important part maybe is the path. And that we can copy. That that's the first example that we need to know that to understand that the the OJR return is a data frame, and we can access to this data. And in the in the next example, they explain the asset argument. Now you 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 can also specify what kind of files you can load, not just pick anything, because in the in the real example, let me run it again. I, I can pick uh, any type, even R scripts, for example. Yeah, I can pick an R script and load because there is no any asset specification. If you want to pick uh, many files, you can using chief or control, Pull them all together. And what it doesn't do is to you pick one. You you cannot pick one by one by default. You need to select all at once. But now, if I run this app after passing this this asset argument. The behavior changes. Now it's waiting for getting a data set. But if I pick here, it say, "Hey, you can. I cannot read this. 
I cannot complete the action. This is what is going on in the app. So here we have the file import function with the specification. We have the number of rows that we want to display below and also the table. That's the simple UI we are using. In the data part, so we we set rep because we need uh, to have an import. So by default, the value is new before updating the file. If I, for example, use part of our debugging class, use browser, and I run this without any file. Yeah, we are already here. If I run this import here, let me open uh, run it here, you see that the value is new. So the rep uh, stop the app until we we unlock any file to avoid any problem. So this is a really important part to take to take care. Okay, let's stop this okay. and, and remove browser. Then we can pick the extension of the file because uh, we, we, we want to have different importation techniques. It is a CSV or a TSV file because in the, the delimitation changes based on the extension of the file. And in all other the cases, we want to, to point out what's the error. So you point a validate and say, hey, you cannot take an R script because I don't have any option to read our script. You need to pick a, one of these files. If we if we pick a valid file. Yeah, we will be able to see the five, the first five rows, or maybe the ten uh, first five rows, and and that's the same. So the important part is to be sure that the the unlock is not empty before making any actions. And if we need, if we have an error, we need to specify to the to the user what is going on, because otherwise. Uh, the the cost the user won't have any clue, and they will ask us, "Hey, your your shiny app is not working <laughs> because we don't have any any validation." As you see here, I removed the the validate part, and there is no any there is no error. The so you we need to take care that using the validate family functions. Then we have this other example. In this example, we're going to pull up a file and then to download. And let's run the app. They explain that we have two types of possible ways to download a file. You can create a download button using passing the classes available in Bootstrap that we saw, I think, in the second chapter, or you can pass a link. So basically, what is the app does is to, we pick a file, it will up, shows the, that, and, and allows us to download the same file. That's what it's doing. We also need to wait until completed, check the extension, uh, take the, the help uh, as a filter data. And for the download bar, we need to use this, this function. So basically in the UI, you just need to say, oh, I want a button and here is the ID. That's the basic thing that you need to uh, no matter you change the specification of the class, 
that will work. And the magic happens inside of the download handler. It has two main arguments. You need to pass the file name, the, the file that will have when you download the data. If, for example, I, I change here the, the app, let me stop them. I, I have two options. I can, if you want a dynamic name, you need to pass an empty function. Hey, I, I want that the file have the same name that you find in the ULOP argument. But I can also pass, for example, my name. And, and that would work. So I pick one file. Uh, and it needs to be a CSV. So, sample. Let me copy this path. Yeah, and if I download, you see here it says Angel. Of course, you need to specify the type, something like that. But it's an, it's, if you use your name, it's always the same name. You also can write it with a function, and that will also work. The epic again, the, the file. Yeah, you see Angel. But for dynamic names, yeah, you need to, to create a function. The second part is the data that we want to get. In this case, I'm getting the filtered data uh, and passing the path. This is the fi uh, this function is always with the file name. Uh, that's not something that you need to worry about because it's already documented. You you run the documentation, you will see that you need to create a, a function with the file argument and the file represent the 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 temporal the, the temporal path that where you are going to save the data. So that the place, if for example, in this case. I have uh, two different uh, do, uh, buttons to download. So I create the handler and then I uh, set to the output one and download two uh, IDs. I first try to do something like, okay, I will save this first and then I will pick this option also and I will save it as the two. But Chani says and uh, have a really good uh, error message that I cannot read output uh, files. So that, that's why I'm creating these temporal arguments to be able to download from any of the bo two buttons. Any questions? Okay, great. So yeah, basically the da download is even more easier than loading files. Then we have these other examples. So let's run the app first to see what's going on. The point of this of this Chinese app is to pick data frames from the data set package that comes always with R. Is one of the default package we see. And we have many data sets. Uh, before running the app, we have we apply some manipulations. We create a function to to, to get or to identify uh, which uh, data frames or, or which names with names of the package. Uh, are really data frames. And we are picking here all the data, all the data available, all the arguments available, objects available in, in that package. If I'm, I'm running now, you wish, uh, of course I cannot run it because I was having a shiny app. So we have a, 
104 uh, objects in that package. Of course, all, all, all of them are data, but no all of them are data frames. And we want just to pick and select from that only, okay, I need to load the, 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 the function. Just the, the few that are, the 44 that are data frames. Uh, once we know what are the data frames in that package, we use the select the select function to have this select bar. Uh, use this out to to return the dimension of the data frame. Table out to to return the the preview because we are just watching the head of the data frame, and also creating a button. Um, yeah, it's almost the same that we have been seeing. We are just uh, using get based on the, the data name from the package as a reactive object. And once it's a reactive object, we pick the, the dimensions after pasting them to have this, the, this weight, so rows times columns, uh, render table to have the preview, and you in passing the same, here we have the data name, uh, it goes from a package, it doesn't have an extension, so we need to, to, to write an extension this, this time, and use the Bloom package to write the file uh, as a tab, as a tab separate file. This, this other one that is not from data, it is related to the, to, a, to create a report. Sometimes you have an app and you want that people use your app and get the resource. And after they have the resource they need, and you want they have a report to generate. And and here we see a channel that select some random numbers, uh, place this, this alert showing that, oh, you're, we are running the sample uh, and showing a final report that you can download. How this works? Uh, you first need to create a temporal file a temporary path to save your file. Ah, okay. I need to stop there. You see here a name with the with the arm down extension. And then you need to copy a your your report, your arm down report to that path. Uh, they do that because when you take your application to production sometimes the the path changes and it's not working the report just because it cannot find the file. So using this trick, creating a temporary file, you can avoid that problem. Also, you need to grab the render function inside another function. And that's because when you are running a shiny app, you don't want to affect a, your environment. And also, you don't want to stop the Shiny app just because you are rendering a file. You want to call another R session using the core R package. Here you, you, will, you can see it, the core R package. Uh, but in order to have the correct behavior, you need to create a custom function and not just a call render inside the core R function. Uh, that was a little bit tricky. Uh, it explained that in the chat, but doesn't explain why. So that's my, that's something most related to the coral uh, behavior that they expect.
when you are running a down file, it creates a it creates the 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 session from the scratch, and you want to have an independent session. So if the, your markdown creates some variables, you don't want those variables to come out to the Shiny app. So that's why we are in a rhythm, uh, like taking the global environment, uh, but creating a new environment based on that environment. So you create a new variable X, running your, your report that won't appear in your Shiny app and won't affect the behavior of your Shiny app. It's like insulating the behavior. And, and that's the way that you, you do it. So let's run the, the ah, we already run it. So we have here the select, selections. Also we have a slicer. And we also have a, the hardware report because that's the only thing that it does. You specify the, the name. And, and here you have the 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 blue render report. So it's a message that to the user that oh we have we are doing something. Don't don't worry about it. And it returns an ID. And then when the functions finish, no exit function after any the function remove the message. So just after you are you have rendered the whole report, it closes that tab automatically based on the ID. That so even though it is on a zip, it just after the measures, it doesn't happen really onto core arms. Part of the reactivity. The steps are not always in order. And then we have the this other Java app that is a little bit more sophisticated as we can pick a file. and apply some manipulations. For example, you can say, oh, this is a CSP, so the delimiter is a is a comma. And you can put EF set, for example, a space. Yeah, it, it's not loaded correctly, or we say a tab. No, it's not rendered correctly. And we can preview the number of rows to show. And also we can click names or remove empty columns. And the main point of this is that you at the end can download the, the file after applying all those manipulations. So it's a really good way to, to empower users. That's basically a, an application of we have seen before. So if we go, if we go up to the to the UI, they apply a really interesting technique in the use. They define first the layout, the the cyber layout. It's like they define first these sessions that we have here in the top, and they define another layout for the second part, the cleaner part, because the the first part is just for importing. And the, and the second one is for cleaning, but they create also a fluid row with 12 columns because that's the, the whole page. And after they define the, the three parts of the Shiny app, they pass to the fluid page and they get the final UI. So yeah, you, you don't need to define all the UI elements inside of the fluid page. You can do it by part. That that's really that's really interesting. Also that way you if you have fewer space uh, fewer space if you you can see that the the banner go first, 
then you will see the main part, and then you will see the second main part. So yeah, it's it's really good even you see him in the in a mobile setting. It was one of the exercises that we see in the chapter. Use the ambient package by Thomas Lin Pedersen to generate a, a wall noise and download the APNG order. And let's run the app to see what is going on. So first I create a banner, a cyber banner, uh, starting with the dimensions of the feature that we want to generate. Then with more options, we have the, the double perturbation type and the amplitude of the, of the perturbations. And we use a render, so when you pick render, it creates the, a picture, and then you can download the picture or download the picture before rendering also, that, that will work also. You download, Ah, no, no, you need to first render because of the hierarchy of, of the actions. And how it works, I already explained you the UI. We will have the, the, the plot output. And I also create a column with, with, uh, with two because I didn't want a big button, just a few columns with the ID, image color, and a label, one of the uh, PNG. In the server side, I create a event react because I don't want to render the image before selecting the button. Passing the dimensions, the perturbation, the amplitude, normalizing and renderizing the ID. Based on the, the output, we plot it, and that's the plot that you, we see here. And we need to plot it again uh, to, to return the output using this, this behavior, because this, you, that's where a ggplot were more easier, but BHR doesn't have so many options to just for the image. And that's it. Do you have any comment or questions? Good stuff, Angel. You know, doing the the you know the and the, the input, the uploading and the downloading. That's good. Yeah, that's and it, it, that's really easy to do. Yeah. So, uh, Something complicated. It was more easier to understand using the code. Mm -hmm. Definitely. The... <laughs> so I think, let me, who's the, let me stop this. We are end.